Jay, yeah. you want to say something? Yo. Go. Okay. Today is the 18th of May, 2015. And I would like to have the topic called Jimmy Carter is diverted into the civil war in Afghanistan. And my guest is Dave DeWitt, who works for the Athens News. And I want to congratulate him because he was at one time a reporter and he's been promoted as associate editor. Uh, Congratulations, sir. Thank you. And he was a former reporter. And I am Robert Whaley, retired historian from Ohio University. And this is the Athens Speak Out, number 331. Now, Jimmy Carter was persuaded by Zub. Zbigniew Brzezinski, his national security advisor, to launch Operation Cyclone into Afghanistan. The CIA hired Pakistani generals and guerrillas or terrorists and sent these fighting troops into Afghanistan to resist the Soviet infiltration into Afghanistan. And they went into a very backward, hilly, mountainous region called Afghanistan. Now, Zubrinsky was convinced that Soviet secret agents had invaded Af Afghanistan, and he pressed Jimmy Carter in June and July of 1979 to authorize Operation Cyclone. Unfortunately for the United States, the Soviet Union was far more informed about the internal politics of Afghanistan, and the Soviets had infiltrated Afghanistan ever since 1955 on uh, Nikita Khrushchev. And they gave technical assistance to the Afghan tribes because these Turkish tribes or Turkey tribes uh, who lived north of Afghanistan, there were five Soviet socialist republics who were ethnic Kajikistans, Kazikistans, the Stans, okay, all Muslim. But they were gradually converted, half of them, to Marxism of some kind. So uh, the Turkish tribes north of Afghanistan were far better educated in the Soviet Union than the backward, rather primitive uh, Turkish tribes living in the old-fashioned Afghanistan, which was nothing but a no-man's land. It was composed of 28 provinces and five different languages, and Kabul was an international city with thousands of immigrants from these provinces who spoke these various different languages of the region. But the Afghan people were 100% Muslims, and the official languages, about one-third of them spoke Iranian or Farsi, another third of them spoke Pashtun, a Pakistani language on the other side of the Himalayan mountains, and another third lived in these five Turkish provinces, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, and Kyrgyzstan. <clears throat> which had been taken over by <clears throat> the Tsarist government. And then in 1919, uh, the Soviets made converts of these Muslim peoples, of a certain minority of them. But the uh, imams south of the border had no trust whatsoever in Russian agents. 
But the Soviet agents then were better educated and were on the ground floor of any civil war in Afghanistan. And the American CIA was coming from the bottom of the deck. Anyway, Afghanistan is the home of opium producers that manufacture morphine, heroin, and uh, drugs uh, was part of the monetary system of the Afghan tribes. You can sell dope instead of trading money. And Jimmy Carter uh, uh, really didn't know much about the problems of Iran or Afghanistan. The problem was bigger than he had ever dreamed. Now, the Himalayan mountains were a huge boundary between Pakistan and Afghanistan, and very few travelers went across those high Himalayas, only through the Khyber Pass. And most of the transportation was through the western door to Iran. That was a wide open plain, and that's why Farsi was the official language of Kabul. But the majority of these people were sheep herders and opium growers, and they ignored these borders. They were nomadic peoples who were not living in the 19th century, let alone the 20th or 21st century. Well, anyway, Operation Cyclone, uh, Jimmy Carter authorized, authorized 20 to 30 million dollars for the first year. But then after Jimmy Carter was defeated and uh, Ronald Reagan took over the operation, they spent ultimately $1.7 billion and finally the Soviets were convinced to withdraw in 1987-1989 and uh, they gave up on Afghanistan as a bad job. Yes, question? Uh, yes. When did uh Congressman Charlie Wilson enter into the picture. Much later. Much later. And then that, that's when he decided to supply the Afghan... Yeah, this is probably it. after 2001, after George Bush got involved. Okay. I don't think Charlie w Wilson was a congressman from Texas back in the 1970s. This is 30 years later. You're off your calendar is what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> But I just, you know, I... You heard the you name? Saw that, you saw that Yeah, movie, what, what year did the movie come out? About five That's years ago, question. right? Do you know, David? Yeah, I would say five years ago. It was probably five years ago. 2010, 2011. Okay. Maybe. Like Tom Hanks or somebody played yeah. that part. But yeah. I do know that they went and they wanted to know, you know, what could they, what kind of weaponry could they acquire? I believe, to... I believe that what I know about Charlie Wilson is that he's a Republican congressman from Texas and the CIA used him as an agent. That's what I think. Yeah. Now, whether he is officially an agent mm -hmm. or whether he was just giving propaganda, but it's, well, there's he, some kind of a he, Texas he connection. Arranged, he arranged for the weaponry to be tested at Quantico. Yeah. And then from there, they approved of right, it. Well, how much money did he get out of it? That's my well, question. that's a good question. I mean, <laughs> how much does any politician receive for anything that they okay. do? But the thing is... Uh, is he still a congressman he, from Texas? He is no, dead. He's ah. dead, yeah. But I wonder how he died. <laughs> but really, the thing is, he played, a, David's probably watched that movie, uh, he played a, a, a big part in ending that. Uh, ending what? Between the Afghans and the... And the, uh, the war is still going on. No, that, uh, that's a different war we got. When does on. the war end and when does it begin? And what war are you talking about? Well, you'd have to ask uh, Barack Hussein Obama that when the war is going to end. You know, that's kind of a question I don't think you could even answer. Okay, I think the question was relevant in some other show, but it's not relevant today. Okay. <laughs> We're all irrelevant, I guess. No, a historian has to follow the calendar. And if you jump around from the War of 1812 to World War II, the conversation doesn't become helpful. Well, I, I, I agree with that. But Good. The, Thank the thing, you. The thing is that... Well, know, I think that our guest here has informed us that these events in 2013 had very little connection to Jimmy Carter's problem 
in 1979 and 1980. Well, I agree with that. Okay, that's all I'm trying to say. Okay. <laughs> you keep on trying to say. Okay. <laughs> okay, we ended that question. <laughs> Do you well, have any Char comment on this? <laughs> well, I, as I understand it, uh, Charlie Wilson, he played his role in the mid to late 80s, and that was well after Jimmy Carter was out of office. In the late 80s? He was elected yeah. from Texas in the late 80s? He, that was when he was a congressman, was during the 80s, and he got involved in Afghanistan. I want to say it was around 86, 87. 86, 87. Something okay. like that. Yeah. That's after the Soviets are about to withdraw. Yeah, that was that was yeah, deep into yeah. deep into okay. the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan. Not a Republican. He I was think, a Democrat. Yeah, I think he was. Yeah, he was a Democrat from Texas. Yeah, and his he just basically played a, a role in arming the um, the the Afghans fighting against the Soviets. Yeah, well, he must have had weapons. he must have had friends in the CIA. Oh, I'm sure. Because yeah. you just I mean, can't be a private enterprise and get in the arms business. Freelance, uh, yeah, <laughs> weapons dealer congressman. Yeah. No, I, he, what he did was he raised the funds to purchase the weapons from yeah. the, from the uh, weapons manufacturer. And, and then armed the Afghan you know, rebels against bills. the Soviet Union. Are you Union. saying these are secondhand weapons? No, or did they come out of the weapon? Did the American taxpayer pay for these weapons? Yes, they certainly did. Yeah. Do you think he was... Had his fingers in the cookie jar. I have no idea, but okay. what politician doesn't? You know? I mean, well, I don't believe that either. I think that Jimmy Carter was an honest politician. No, I'm not. Hey, <laughs> I want to clarify that. Uh, Jimmy Carter was a good, honest man. Probably okay. the only honest president we've had in numerous years. Okay. Yeah. Well, getting back to our summary here and the main topic, Jimmy Carter was diverted by Zbigniew uh, Brzezinski into authorizing this Operation Cyclone. And as time went on, I think he had regret that he ever got involved. He kind of kicked the football into the field. So I think I will stop our summary there and ask the first question of our guest, Dave DeWitt. What did the American people know about the opium business as of 1980? <laughs> I would say probably not very much. Okay. I mean, they, a select few citizens might have had an idea about how, you know, where opium came from and things like that, but I don't think the public at large had a very, very comprehensive understanding of the opium business. Okay, Probably. I agree that it was not very much. And I don't think that Cyrus Vance or the big new Brzezinski knew much about it. But when they hire Pakistani soldiers and they hire guerrillas to get involved in Afghanistan, opium is going to become smuggled across those borders to pay people off. And heroin is the most fungible of the commodities. You get more profits per square inch from heroin. But then uh, there were other drugs involved in the Vietnam War, and the American soldiers got involved in heroin, uh, cocaine, LSD, peyote, uh, marijuana. So from uh, 1965 to 75, uh, if the CIA had any statistics on the opium trade in Afghanistan, so far they haven't published very much about them. And the Drug Enforcement Agency uh, was working at cross purposes uh, from the CIA. Officially, uh, Nixon in 1971 declared a so-called war against drugs, and the Drug Enforcement Agency in 1973 was trying to suppress the drug trafficking in the United States. But nobody was watching what goes on in Vietnam or Afghanistan or in the foreign fields. Now, I did learn something about drugs from a historian by the name of Alexander McCoy, who did a serious book, two books actually, on uh, how drugs demoralized the American army in Indochina from 1961 to 1975. 
and he did a lot of research there. And uh, I got some insight into the CIA's unofficial uh, smuggling of drugs across frontiers. But there are few people who have any real facts on this because the research has not been done. Now, I began to become interested in drugs at age 24, and I began to do research on alcohol, tobacco, and then in 1954, we had a heroin problem in the United States, very small by comparison. Mm -hmm. But we had mafia agents in New York that sold uh, heroin from Italy and Marseille, France, and they used to be uh, junkies and people who had to go to jail for heroin addiction. So gradually, as you do research, you learn that there are no boxes that don't have porous. If, if you're dealing in one drug, you're dealing with 25, 30 drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the way a drug salesman operates. He has a little suitcase and he'll sell you any kind of a drug uh, you want, okay? Now, I have a friend by the name of John Burnham, and this is where uh, Steve Vannell is well informed. He's written a book called Bad Habits, and this is a very good book, uh, written by a social historian at Ohio State. And he, it's a good book for parents and students who should read these bad habits. Published in 1993. Published in 1993. And these uh, has six uh, bad habits. The bad habits is the title. Mm -hmm. The bad habits in six chapters are alcoholism, smoking, drug taking, sexual misbehavior, gambling, and swearing. Now, I never read the swearing chapter. I think that's a rather a petty uh, sin, we'll say. But according to Burnham, swearing is important if you're 12, 13 years old. Because the kid who gets into swearing goes to a pool hall and starts playing pool. Then he's offered a cigarette, and then he starts smoking here and there. Then he's offered a glass of beer, and then he's, asked, uh, 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 he's, he's going down the slippery slope. And then marijuana. Oh, how about cocaine, buddy? That's the problem of the six bad habits. Well, one, one of the problems with swearing, Robert, is that not only is it obnoxious, but it limits a person's vocabulary. Right. Because they've got, you know, a swear word to, you know, for everything. You want to be one of the boys. Yeah, you want to be one of the boys. You want to be yeah. popular. Yeah. But so, it does limit your vocabulary if you engage in... A swearing all the time, you know. Well it, it will, well, it depends whether you get a PhD and you begin to talk politely. Correct. Now, you can't use four-letter words no, and get a PhD all. from your professor. And you can't use, if you go into business, you can't use four-letter words. Well, you can. It, it, well, behind the can. scenes, in the clubhouse. Perhaps. This is called machoism. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, that's the thesis of, of John Burnham, whose mother, whose father, wait, John Burnham was probably raised in a Protestant church, but he's never told the world that. And he's married to a loyal Methodist, and he's had five kids. And these bad habits would have been called Six. Six Venial Sins, if that book had been published in 1948 when I graduated from high school. Right. So it's a book that is kind of old-fashioned in a way. Okay. It still applies. I think it applies if you're scholarly. Yeah. But you, I've, I've met a very uh, recent uh, girl who uh, thinks she's going to get a PhD in sexology. And I asked her a question, have you ever heard of um, Alfred Kinsey? She had no idea who Alfred Kinsey was. <laughs> what? 
thought that was sexology 101. Yeah, Kenzie should be the baseline. Yeah, right. You know, he's the first one to really. Well, do you ought to go to Ohio study. University and start quizzing around <laughs> of what these kids know and don't know about drugs and I'd alcohol say, and the connection. Yeah. Well, Kenzie was. What are these? What are these? Uh, the famous Kinsey 1948. Yeah, yeah. What are these sexual misbehaviors? Yeah. Hmm? Well, I think they've heard of Playboy. I think everybody's heard of Playboy. Right. Oh yeah. But yeah, I don't. I problems. don't think my wife has ever read a copy of it. She senses herself. <laughs> 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 they used to have some really good writers in there. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, anyway, to get on with this uh, drug problem, do you want to have any uh, comments or questions about the uh, drug problem as it's perceived in Athens County? In Athens County? Yeah, that's what you're the expert on. Yeah. You, you were on um, a show. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, as me and Steve discussed, uh, the, the heroin problems and the meth problems are growing. Right. And the most concerning thing about this is that 90% uh, 90, 90 of property crime, theft, burglary, I believe robbery, that. that stuff is caused by drug addiction. Right. So that's why it's so important to address. And my position is that we need to do more to address addiction treatment because for every dollar that you spend addressing addiction, you okay. save $7 in law enforcement costs later on. Right. Now, I have written a little summary of the show here that... You Steve and you did. It's called uh, Discussion of uh, Dave DeWitt and Steve Handel, uh The Illegal Opium Drug Traffic in Athens County. Is that a fair title? Uh, yeah. Of the show you did? Yeah. Now, I have suggested that you and Steve do a follow up on that, in which I will be the guest and sit here, and the two of you can sit here at the table. And I will ask questions about your show and suggest uh, expansion of that. Now, if you don't want to do that show, we can skip that as a possibility. But anyway, we can think about that after this show. Sure. Okay. In this case, to get back to Jimmy Carter's problem in uh, Afghanistan, I read a researched article, not a book, but a researched article by a Canadian economist called Michael Chosodovsky, who teaches economics at the University of Ottawa. And he wrote of his experience on the UN committee, which supposedly is repressing the drug trafficking throughout the world. And he also worked for the Clinton administration when Clinton was involved with drug enforcement during the Yugoslav Civil War in 1991-1999, when the Serbs and the Croats and the Albanians and the Greeks and eight nationalities were in the smuggling business and drugs became available in the Yugoslavian War as they do in all wars. So anyway, he had some insights on this. And this article that he wrote uh, was called uh, Washington's Hidden Agenda, Restoring the Drug Trade. And he has some, he has some statistics on Afghanistan. And this article was published in October 2001 after George Bush 43 gets involved in Afghanistan. And the data he has only begins in 2001. He has no data whatsoever in the period from Afghanistan on opium trade between uh, 1980 and 2001. So we have to have some further research on the Afghan drug business going back to the 1920s up to uh, 1991 when uh, Kosasovsky's uh, article begins. Anyway, uh, Afghanistan, like Mexico, uh, like uh, the Latin American countries, Bolivia, are in the drug, uh, Cuba are in the drug 
business. And the problem with drugs is that we have experts on Cuba, experts on Mexico, experts on Afghanistan, experts on China, and nobody has a real comprehensive survey of the drugs as a business or the consumption problem as a health problem in the United States. They're looking at it from the different end of the telescope. Some people have the telescope this way, and other people have the other end and see a different picture. <laughs> That's all I want to say about this complex problem of the so-called war on drugs, which is a propaganda metaphor. It's like saying the war on high prices, the Cold War. <laughs> Whenever people good. use the word war. <laughs> That's a pretty good assessment. Yeah, hold, hold your hat. <laughs> There should be a repression of the drug traffic, and that is a real problem. How do you have the sheriffs and the drug enforcement suppress drug trafficking? That was the problem of national prohibition. Yeah. Nobody could prohibit everybody in the United States from drinking alcohol, but drug trafficking was the issue. Yeah. But kids don't make the connection between trafficking, possession, the differences between heroin and cocaine and how harmful each may be. That's the problem of education about the complexities of drugs. Robert, I, th yeah. I think one of David's findings was that less than 1% of the drugs in, that come into the country and that are within the country uh, right. The DEA was only able to stop less than 1%, okay. even though we spent billions of dollars every year. Right. Afghanistan is responsible for 87% of the heroin that comes into this country. As of now. You're right. Mm -hmm. And Mexico was number two, right. but I don't know that it was responsible well, for that other 13, but it is number two in line. But. Right. right. Yeah, that's, that's interesting up-to-date statistics. Now, I went to a seminar about 10 years ago in which there was a panel on drugs. And I heard a very good talk of a historian who wanted to suppress drug trafficking in the United States. And he said, well, if they're really serious, if the Drug Administration is really serious, they would have inspectors at every airport in the United States on the conveyor belt as the packages come across. Because these mafia people put $100 bills and pack it in a suitcase. And a regular suitcase with clothing in goes right through, no problem. But if you have a weight of the, the size, take the square uh, centimeters of the suitcase and the weight a hundred dollar bill is packed, whoosh, the scale would ring a bell. Yeah. So the key is mon money laundering, L money right. laundering, exactly. money laundering. Right. That's what happens when you're yeah. old. The Bank of America, Chase Manhattan, Wells Fargo, these drug dealers bring hundred dollar bills in and they get recycled. They can't use checks because the banks do check. If somebody sends a $100,000 check, yeah, bingo, that's recorded. The CIA is going to record that. But that's the way to cut down drug trafficking. But it's only good in the United States. You yeah. can't go into the hills of Afghanistan and look for <laughs> Osama bin Laden right. and find any drugs. <laughs> you know, Robert, one time in, in Miami, Florida, DEA found a warehouse full of hundred dollar bills. That's good stuff. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know uh, they were bundled. Right. Just like you would bundle a, right. a, you know, a bale of hay. Right. And I was serious. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> we're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. But, hmm. but you know what? I, I wanted to share this information with you. Uh, you know, I was in the trucking industry for uh, a, a lot of years, but a lot of times to get drugs from LA to let's say Newark, New Jersey, or anywhere in the country for that matter, but let's do a cross country trip. Okay. Is 
they they'll have somebody working at the warehouse that's involved with the drug traffickers. We're All talking right. about uh, Whitey Bulger. Why, says, Whitey Bulger, Boston. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, Boston. Yeah, Whitey Bulger. And I'll tell you sometime about how Whitey Bulger was successful in, in uh, doing... Logan Airport. Did. Logan Airport. <laughs> but, but, yeah, exactly, in Boston. But what they, what they do is... Um, the shipper, let's say the shipper's Nabisco, they don't know anything about it, but there's an employee that does know about it. They will take a, a, a truckload of cookies, they will put their cocaine or whatever in the middle right. of those cookies. They'll that's load it on that truck. That's right. On the receiving end, let's say it's going to another Nabisco factory in, in Newark, they don't know anything about it, but there's one employee that does. When they unload that right. load of cookies, they take out the drugs and set it aside, the right. package aside. And so, you know, the trucking companies, uh, well, the, the shippers incurred the cost of shipping those drugs. The, mm -hmm. the, the, truck, the trucking companies provided the transportation of those drugs. And only two people know about it. I mean, you, you got the ones on the shipping end and you have the ones on the receiving end. Right. You know, so a lot of people don't realize that probably when they're out on the freeway, they're passing trucks that are loaded with drugs. The driver doesn't know. That's right. You know. That's right. And um, I think that's excellent information. Yeah. yeah. A plus for observation. <laughs> <laughs> We got, we got to put that in a historical memoir. <laughs> okay, let's go on to a second problem here. I think we've already discussed that. I, we did that inadvertently. Let's go on to another question here. What did Carter's military action, why did it fail? to rescue 52 American prisoners <laughs> from Tehran. And that was launched on the 24th of April, 1980, when three helicopters with eight crew right. took off right. from two aircraft carriers. Right. You want to expand on that? answers that, we, we got to take a break. Oh boy, we got through that pretty. Yeah. Well, I guess we got through. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say it was quickly or not. But we had fun. <laughs> oh, always. <laughs> so. Um, well, we got to take the station break. Yeah. I'm speaking with Dave DeWitt, and we're supposedly going to talk about Jimmy Carter's last year, 1980, when he was inadvertently diverted into the Afghan Civil War and had no idea how to resolve the conflict with the Iranian revolutionary students and ended up in a failed uh, presidency in his attempt to be reelected in 1980. But going back to April, uh, and of course I am Robert Whaley, retired historian, who's been at this business for 331 shows, uh, and uh, but getting back to April uh, 1980, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, military intervention uh, flopped. Would you like to explain explain that how and why and what happened? Well, I think the first thing that should be noted is that he attempted negotiations three times before attempting this, right. and each time they failed. Each time. He met with, uh, he had people meet with moderates in Paris, I believe. Moderates. Moderates. Well, now, there's a tricky word. It's a tricky <laughs> word. <laughs> Who's so a moderate? So-called moderates. <laughs> okay. But then uh, when, they, when they got back to Iran, whatever deal that was hashed out was shot down, and none of them went through. So negotiations failed three times. They, they talked to uh, Iranian uh, agents of the Ayatollah? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. They, yeah. were, they were in this Iranian... A Republican, the Islamic Republican government. Right. Officially, Newly formed. Yeah, officially yeah. the Tsar is out of power, uh, the uh, Shah Sorry. is out of power. Yeah. Okay. So. Anyway, the moderate didn't want to do business with Carter. 
No, they, 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 I don't think they ever had any intention of actually following through on these negotiations. So finally, Carter says, okay, uh, we'll do something militarily. He shut Vance out of this. That's right. Well, well Vance, Vance, was so, Vance was so opposed, he, he resigned. resigned. He resigned. And he was out of it. Right. So, but uh, Brzezinski and Carter decided to go through with this, what's right. become known now as Desert One. Right. Desert One. Right. That's the helicopter operation. Right. That's one the, helicopter. Right. There was a Desert Two and Desert Three. Is that right? It? Three helicopters. Well, what, what I understand, this is the story that I know. Yeah. Okay. Um, was that there were as many as eight helicopters? I think the mission was actually called Eagle Claw. Oh, I see. And the there eight, was, did the eight take there, off? Well, they took off, but what happened is they run into this sandstorm, and there's this sandstorm going on, and because they're across. Uh, enemy lines, there's no radio contact between them. Nobody knows what to do. Because if you're in planes, you can fly above a sandstorm. Right. If you're in helicopters, you have to deal with the sandstorm, and it's kind of harrowing. It feels like they don't know if they're... One helicopter almost crashed into a mountain. Yeah. And he said, oh, I think, I think the mountain's close now, and he pulled up at the last second and avoided it. I so think, there's, David, I think the most helicopters of the type that was in that operation, yeah. they only have a ceiling of a, about 16,000 feet. 16,000, yeah. And, you know, of course, Afghanistan is, you yeah. know, in that area is uh, quite mountainous. So. so in these deserts, these storms kick up, these sandstorms occasionally, and this threw off the entire operation. What ended up happening is that some of the helicopters decided to turn around, they figured the mission's aborted, they left, they went back. Um, other ones thought, oh, we figure everyone's going to press forward, so we're going to press forward with it, and, and they go forward. So you've got everyone in disarray, a total lack of communication, and some people abandoning the mission, other people trying to go forward with the mission. Right. And, and all of this leads to a lot of egg on Jimmy Carter's face in the end. Chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would like to say something about the uh, prisoners. Originally, there were 66 prisoners in Tehran, and 13 were women and blacks, and they were released by the Iranian revolutionaries in order to influence the left-wing press in the United States because the Iranian revolutionaries wanted to convince the United States that Iran was an old civilized country, uh, actually older than Christian civilization. And the Ayatollah uh, was trying to uh, not be considered a war criminal. Robert, so, is, yeah. are those the people that fled to the Canadian embassy? I don't know the, who the 13 were, I, I, I think it's but I think they got out through them, the community. All of them, yeah. Yeah, they got NBC. out of the... Yeah. So there are only 52 left, yeah. and 13 got out. And then there was one white who was old, and they didn't want this white to die. Yeah. So they got rid of one white and these blacks and women, and that gave 52 that stayed there until the very last day yeah, in 1981. I, I do believe, black yeah. member, right, they went to a Canadian embassy instead of, you know. Right. Well, the Canadians had goodwill right. from both sides. Right. Canada is a... And they were a little more tolerant. Of yeah, Canadians well, they, sure. Yeah. The Canadians didn't have a CIA. Or if right. they did, they were playing low key at right. it. <laughs> and uh, they didn't have an oil company. Right. They dealt with the British and the Americans. Right. <laughs> and they had to buy oil from the same uh, uh, multinational corporations. You get it all figured out. <laughs> so there's so, these 52 hostages. They remain. And yeah, because of the disarray, uh, not enough helicopters arrived, right. according to the military, right. and they asked Carter to ab abandon the mission, and he agreed right. to. Now, the th 52 remained until January 8, 1981. After 444 the days. Yeah. 444 days. And uh, they were released the day that uh, Ronald Reagan was inaugurated. Right. So the world knew that uh, the Ayatollah made a deal with Ronald Reagan, but wouldn't make a deal with Jimmy Carter. That is the tragic uh, story of Jimmy Carter's end.
Now, uh, Cyrus Vance resigned on the 28th of April, which was too soon in a way, because that left Jimmy Carter with no alternative to Zabrinsky. <laughs> right. There was nobody in the right. State Department. Right, there was department. no counterbalance. Yeah, there was no yeah. counterbalance. And uh, uh, I guess uh, Vance gave up with detente uh, SALT II in June of 79. So the end of uh, detente and the decision to uh, get involved with Afghanistan uh, are kind of dovetailing together here. Now, I'd like to turn our attention to TV. Do you know much about Ted Koppel as a star? I know him as the news anchor, longtime yeah. news anchor at NBC. Right. Um, well, he, in, he was not exactly a news anchor. He invented, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he invented a new show called Nightline. Mm -hmm. Now, this show was different than the 6.30 show. This show came on 10 or 11 at night, and only political junkies, political science majors, and people who were working in inside Washington listened to this show. And for a while, I thought Ted Koppel was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I thought he was cleverer than uh, Cronkite, uh, Cronkite, Walter Cronkite. Yeah. I said, this guy is really objective. He's giving us news we don't hear elsewhere. Did you ever see Ted Koppel? Well, certainly. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> the other guy that I liked really well was Bill Moyers. You know? I still well, like Bill Moyers. Bill Moyers was a protege of Lyndon Johnson. He was his press secretary. He was a believing Baptist. He was a liberal Baptist. And he sympathized with Jimmy Carter. Right. But uh, Ted Koppel is a different character. He, he, that's true, but I'm just saying Bill Moyers was, you know, he was yeah. interesting to listen to. Uh, Bill Moyers was a good TV man, yeah. and, but Ted Koppel had more exposure. Yeah. Bill Moyers came on once a week. Yeah. Nightline yeah. came on seven, yeah. six nights, no, not seven nights, but four nights a week. Yeah, and it was always enlightening. Well, it, it was his too. show. It was his yeah. show. Yeah. And he developed this 444 days because exactly. every night he'd get on there. Well, this is day 80. When is Jimmy Carter going to move? What's the matter with this appeaser? Ah, next week it's uh, day 92, day 93, day 90. Well, he just so stuck a pin in Jimmy Carter every one of those 444 days. Now, oops. that's clever television. That's clever propaganda. It builds up the pressure. Builds up yeah, the pressure. Certainly. So the question is, did Jimmy Carter... Do, do, do you think he was some sort of political operative or just a... I'm, I'm saying person? that at the time, I thought Jimmy Co that uh, Ted Koppel was a great TV reporter. Okay. And I thought he was, quote, objective. Right. But after looking at the history of this, I was taken in they by Ted. He had a, a certain think, political agenda? He had a definite political agenda. Okay. Let me tell you who Ted, Ted Koppel is. Okay. His parents were German Jews. They came to England in 1940. Ted Koppel was educated in Britain. He spoke with a perfect British accent. Cambridge or what? He was born in, 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 in London. Now, okay. he went to high school in London. And he came to the United States, and the point is that he was a better TV anchorman than any of the competition. The best TV anchormen are Canadians, because they don't talk with a Brooklyn accent like I do, or like Bernie Sanders. And nobody in the world had a clue that he was Jewish. You didn't know he was Jewish? No, I didn't know. Did you know he was Jewish? No. <laughs> That's how propaganda works. <laughs> so Ted Koppel. So do you think that he was doing this countdown as a political tactic? Because it sounds to me like there could be an argument that could be made that it's just savvy uh, television media, you know, get it, rope the audience in. Day 93, day okay. 90, day 150, no, day no, no, 160, no, 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 you know, that's, a, that's stuff no, no. that audiences love. Oh, I, I'm, I don't say he didn't win the audience. Yeah. But you'd think that his motivation was deeper than that. 
deeper I do. than just winning the I audience. I do. I'm going to explain a little bit about who Ted Koppel is, and why he rose, and why he kept this night line going all during the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ted Koppel is no fool. But are you going to say, Robert, that he had ties to Langley? Uh, I'm sure that the CIA had links to Ted Koppel's news. I don't say that Ted Koppel had interviewed in the headquarters. I don't say that. Right. But if you listen to what if you listen to what Ted Koppel is saying, and you listen to what Ted Koppel is saying about public information, what is he saying about Clinton? What is he saying about right. Mondale? What is he saying about Kissinger? Well, what is he saying about every senator in the United States? So, I, we could almost bet that it was being viewed in McLean, Virginia. Oh, I'm sure McLean, Virginia was watching Ted <laughs> Koppel. <laughs> That's, I'm sure. But I don't think there was a CIA agent, now there may be, but I have no evidence that there was a CIA agent that went to Nightline and said, okay, here's the briefing for today. No, I, don't, I think it was very indirect. So, okay. When I saw Ted Koppel, I thought he was better than Walter Cronkite. I thought he was very objective. And he was pointing these days, and I learned a lot from Ted Koppel about the fate of the Carter administration. Okay. But uh, Carter then was facing a dilemma, and the dilemma was Neville Chamberlain appeasement. Mm -hmm. That was the implication. Is Ted uh, Ted Koppel is suggesting, well, is Jimmy Carter really an appeaser? What is he going to do about the Ayatollah? Is he going to take action? What I'm saying is that this operation, Desert One, Desert Two, that may have been deliberately done by Jimmy Carter in order to prove to Ted Koppel, I'm not an appeaser. Right. He was kind of goaded into it. Yeah. That's what I'm suggesting. I see. Because, d d in other words, if, if that operation had succeeded, then Jimmy Carter would have come out, well, you see, yeah. I'm no appeaser. Well, I took did, action. Did anybody ever accuse Jimmy of being a Neville Chamberlain? Yeah. That, if you look at all of the Ted Koppel shows, I think the word appeasement and Munich was suggested. Now, I haven't been through all the shows, okay. but we'd have to take a special trip down to Tennessee where they have all of the recordings of all of the Ted Koppel shows, and you'll see how he tilts the news. But I didn't see how he was tilting it. Now, here's how he tilted it. He would have Kissinger on there seven times for every time he had Walter Mondale. But I didn't pick that up. He would have Kissinger on one week, and then he'd have to talk about Eisenhower, and then he would talk about uh, World War II, and he would talk about uh, Britain and so forth. And then oh, we've got to be fair. We've got to have Walter Mondale. But if you count up the number of shows, the Vice President of the United States, Walter Mondale, was not on Ted Koppel very often. That is, there were six Republican senators for every one Democrat. Yeah. That's how you tilt the news. Right. Now, he was very objective for each night show. He asked very embarrassing questions of both the Republicans and the Democrats. And it looked like he was on the ball, and he knew more about the facts. He knew his facts. And Mondale was innocently telling Mondale's story. But he didn't have much time to get his story across. And Henry Kissinger did. Yeah. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> it's selection of the news. Didn't, so, uh, Robert, didn't David once say that Henry Kissinger upset the apple cart in Paris? Wasn't that oh, the 68, yeah. Well, the Nixon administration did. 
Oh, during the Well, not the, the not actually it was before. The Nixon campaign did. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, see, the Carter, I mean, uh, Couple was not a one-issue man. He would have a, a show about VE Day. Multifaceted. Yeah, he'd have a show on Zukov, variety. But he always had three minutes to say, well, this is day 180. Yeah. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to poor Jimmy? He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't knock Jimmy as being dumb or stupid. He just said he's he's above his pay grade, you know. He 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 hasn't taken any action yet. Yeah. That's what Carter kept. That's what Coppola kept or saying. Or maybe he was suggesting that Carter was indecisive. Indecisive, yeah, that's a key word. But it's a different handling of the news. That's what I'm saying. And you didn't see him do any exposure of of Kasich. Uh, uh, William Casey. Mm -hmm. Carter, a uh, couple never put Casey Garden there, did he? <laughs> That's Probably the selection not. of the news. <laughs> he, did, he didn't put Walter, he didn't put Zabinski. Yeah, I think Bill Casey was hands off. Yeah, and I don't think he put Zabrinsky on there very much. He didn't come across as a, as a Catholic. No, you didn't see much about it. Well, he didn't put the Pope on there. But I'll tell you who he put on. Those uh, TV television evangelists, Robinson. Yeah. Oh, what a jerk, Pat, Robinson. Pat, Pat, Pat Robinson. Robinson. Yeah. Uh, Robinson. Yeah. Evangelicals were poison. Poison. This is the Jewish bias. Right. Jewish bias. Well, you know, Robert, <laughs> maybe that was his objective to mix it up. So much that it was nobody clever. knew where he was coming from. Well, you can if you study history. Yeah. But oh, yeah, this is I did I that didn't that notice that. it at the time. Okay. Yeah. You were mesmerized. I, I was mesmerized. But when I did this show, I said, well, let's investigate, yeah. Jimmy, uh, the rise of Nightline. So Nightline was prepared before uh, April. The Nightline program was designed in ABC as a special program on the 24th of March, 1980. Mm -hmm. So ABC and Ted Koppel in particular could guess that there's going to be trouble with Jimmy Carter, that Jimmy Carter would probably flop. That's what I'm suggesting. So he was one, it was one month later on the 24th of April that Carter launched the helicopter rescue mission. And, and, then, and Koppel already had, well, this is day 60, this is day 61. He had the days already numbered because ABC 630 News was already talking about the day. Mm -hmm. And then Koppel just expanded on this and, and drilled it in. So as I say, you got the impression that Koppel stuck a pin in Jimmy Carter's reputation 444 days. Yeah. And that was clever television reporting. It was all reporting. It was all true. He didn't tell any lies. Yeah. It's just a careful selection of the news to make sure. uh, Jimmy Carter look... Source bias. Yeah, uh, look a little bit foolish, okay. Now, whether he knew that the helicopters would crash, that's another story. That's another conspiracy. Right. Was there somebody in the CIA knew that those helicopters couldn't make it? Who decided to put the helicopters on the aircraft carrier? Yeah. And and chance this desert. Yeah. That's that's another part of the so-called conspiracy. Well, we'll get into that in phase two of this. Anyway, I just want to say a little bit more about uh, 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 couples careful television. Okay. But he, was, he came across very objective. That's the main point. And he kept his Jewishness under wraps. But whether he voted for Ronald Reagan or not would be a very interesting story. I'm not sure that he's ever said. He's, they kept that quiet. That <laughs> I think, um, but most Jews did not vote for Ronald Reagan. 
He was considered a flake. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's an interesting point that you make about source bias because we see that in the media all the time right. these days. Now, another interesting thing about Ted Koppel. Yeah, he Robert, we got about two minutes. Or all right, well, just one more word about it then. Uh, he came on 10.30, 11 o'clock. He had the whole hour to himself. Mm -hmm. With 6.30 news, ABC, they were doing two minutes on England, three minutes on Ireland, uh, six minutes on Africa. You just sure, get a yeah, uh, hodgepodge. Time. And yeah. I guess we'll have to stop at this point. And we've been talking about uh, why Jimmy Carter was diverted from his original peace message. And I don't think that Carter, uh, Koppel ever said a word about the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian problem. He just focused on Iran. Well, I have to stop at this point. Okay. I'm glad you came and you can give your summary. Well, we've been talking about, uh, well, first we started talking about uh, the role of opium in Afghanistan during the Soviet war there and subsequent wars there right. uh, that have been ongoing. Um, and then uh, we started uh, in on the hostage crisis in Iran that led to the downfall of the Carter administration and the right. public opinion and the media coverage of that, specifically by Ted Koppel of Nightline. Yeah, okay. And I want to thank you for coming. And what I want to do is raise debates. And I should have been debating uh, Koppel 10 years ago, but I didn't have the intelligence to do it. Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you for having me, Professor. <laughs>